Everyone, welcome to the Uke Stuff podcast and the Uke Stuff channel. I have with me today Rodney Huguche. This is part two of an interview that we did together, uh, talking first about Rodney's life and how he got to playing the ukulele. And today's topic is going to be focusing on um, his teaching and his resources, and we'll actually take a look at some of those. So I'll bring Rodney up on the screen here. And so Rodney, let's talk about where you start having your first students and what you learn as you start teaching. Okay, uh, let me go one step further back. Okay. And I think, do you remember a site called, I think it was uh, Ukulele Cosmos or something like yes. that? Yes. Out of Great Britain? Yes. Um, <clears throat> let me go, actually, let me go another step further back. Um, in 2003, I heard that there was a group of ukulele players who gathered monthly at a place called Dusty Strings, which is a you know a fairly famous uh, acoustic instrument. They make harps and you know they repair guitars and whatnot. They have a, a nice uh, a nice. Oh, did you visit them by the way when you were in Seattle? Did not. Or, we or we did most of the main touristy things. Yeah. You know, Pike's Place. Yeah, and... Pike Market. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So anyway, Dusty Strings uh, had an unfinished basement, and they allowed Supa to play. And I guess Supa start, uh, got started, uh, Seattle Ukulele Players Association. Uh, they're on the website as seattleukulele.org, because Supa had already been grabbed up as a moniker of some kind. So seattleukulele.org. And there's there's a lot of uh, resources there, so I encourage listeners to to go and visit the website. Anyway, I first heard about it in 2003 in April, uh, and I guess they had recently started in January. So I I thought they had been going on for years, and so I finally went in April of 2003. Found out they just started three four months earlier, and I thought I thought man this is this is neat you know and they had um, acquired a songbook from another group that had started a year earlier, uh, Puget Sound Strummers. And their songbook was just a collection of, uh, you know, various uh, handouts from people. And so there was no consistency in, term of, in terms of format. But they had collected, you know, quite a few songs and, and uh, reproduced it or published it as their own songbook. So Supa was able to acquire that and play from that back in 2003. So then I started attending Supa regularly uh, at that point, and they met every month. Uh, in the process, because I knew one of the founders of Supa, who, by the way, did not share the information that, they, that he had started an ukulele group. But anyway, um, uh, little by little, uh, you know, they started inviting me up to help lead the singing because I have a loud, a loud voice, singing voice and whatnot. <laughs> and I could carry a tune, you know, which is, which was helpful. And uh, over the next year or so, different the ones said, you know, we ought to, we ought to make, get our own songbook and make it more uh, visually consistent and whatnot. And so that's how we got the Supa 2005-07 songbook. And so we, we, called out the songs that we liked from the Puget Sound Strummer songbook, and then we added other strongs. And in the meanwhile, uh, the Northwest Folklife Festival, um, uh, let's see, one of our members was uh, involved with them and said, you know, uh, there may be spots available for ukulele groups to come and play. So we ended up playing at the Northwest Folklife Festival and became almost a yearly uh, participant in that. So then closer to, well, 2008 or nine, we decided to, uh, you know, we, we were collecting songs. So basically by being a part of Supa, I now had a, a place where a lot of the songs that I had collected for my own quote unquote, uh, performance book, uh, I was able to share some of those songs, introduce them to the song circle. People seemed to like it. And so when we, um, started to collect material for the second song book, uh, 
uh, Supa 2010, I was able to share a lot of the music that I had uh, arranged. And then I worked with a guy who was able to format everything the way that it, it, uh, it could be where you have the song sheet plus two vertical lines of cording, one for GCEA and one for baritone tuning, which is really nice and helpful. Um, so anyway, so then we did the uh, 2010 book. And it was uh, not shortly thereafter, but within the next decade, um, a couple came, uh, Eric and Chantel Klobus. He's a professional musician as well as a, a very, very gifted auto mechanic. In, you know, he was so good, uh, especially with German cars. He worked for University Volkswagen. Uh, other, other repair places would call and ask for him because over the phone, he could diagnose almost any problem. And so if somebody had a, had a difficulty, like, I don't know why this is happening. What do you think? And he would think a little bit and he'd give a suggestion and yep, that was it. You know, so anyway, he had a really good reputation, <clears throat> but he was a musician. He plays trumpet and he wanted to get his wife involved in music and anything from tuba uh, to guitars to, you know, all kinds of instruments. Finally, he got an ukulele for her, brought her to Supa and and she said, oh, you know, this is this is pretty good. I think I might be able to learn this. Uh, what's what kind of uh, motivated her uh, to start Strom was Super Met monthly. So that's just, you know, 12 times a year. And she wanted to do something weekly. So she contacted the Super Board, which is a, uh, you know, a nonprofit or organizes a nonprofit organization and said, if I if I organize something on a weekly basis, you know, can I have your permission to announce it? And uh, you know, we're not going to try to compete with Supa. Whenever Supa meets, we'll get gather with Supa. But you know, we just want to do something weekly. And they said, they said, if you're willing to do the work, yes, you can do whatever you want. If you want <laughs> us to do it, we're not going to do it. But if if this is something you want to do, then great. So about nine years ago, Chantel contacted the Army Corps of Engineers who had um, oversight over the Ballard uh, Hiram Chittenden locks, the locks between Puget Sound and Lake Washington. And uh, because her husband had been playing there uh, every summer with, with the uh, city band or city orchestra, I forget what technically what they're called and so across the across the walkway from the museum is a just a cement block patio like thing fairly large and uh it was a summertime and so she thought you know we could just meet there outside because she didn't have any other place and the army corps of engineers agreed it wasn't being used for anything and so we began meeting on wednesdays and um she asked me to join them as the song leader as they were going to start this you know, back about nine years ago. And they started meeting weekly and also attending SUPA. And we did that for a while. And uh, pretty soon we decided we're, we're just going to need to focus our attention on this new group. So there were a lot of, a lot of um, emails flying back and forth as we got more people interested and we needed a name. So eventually we came up with Strum. Seattle's totally relaxed ukulele musician. You know, it was, uh, uh, we had all kinds of weird options, you know, for that, uh, for that uh, S-T-R-U-M acronym. Um, but eventually we settled on Seattle's totally relaxed ukulele musician. So then Strum got started and I weaned myself away from Supa. They had, they had had other uh, strong song leaders at that point. So they weren't going to miss me that much. And so then I started, uh, when, when, when Strum started, you know, I started meeting with them weekly and, and then eventually we, uh, created our own songbook and, uh, we had organized or, uh, Chantel and her husband, Eric had organized a cruise of Lake Washington, just a tour boat, but we were going to commandeer the whole thing. And <laughs> as, almost like giveaways because it was like 50 60 dollars you know per person uh we created the songbook 
initially it was just going to be, you know, 30, 40 songs. But as we were preparing it, they said, we want, we might as well just make it our regular song and start filling it up with all kinds of songs. And so that became um, the cruise songbook, which is volume one. And since then we create, we started adding more songs, collecting more songs, and we came up with volume two and we called it the locks songbook. <laughs> and we're in the process of uh, gathering and rearranging everything for volume three. And we had a get together at one of our members' uh, family's property called Mountain Meadows. So that's the Mountain Meadows Volume 3 songbook. But a friend of mine had been teaching a beginner ukulele up in the city of Edmonds, uh, Washington, at the Francis Anderson Center. And he had already retired, I believe. But he was going to move to the island of Hawaii, the uh, the Hawaii Island, the big island, used to be called the Big Island. Technically, they want it called Hawaii Island now. But anyway, he was going to move and vacate that ukulele position. And he asked me if I wanted to take over his class. You know, it's it was it's quite a distance away. And it's like over an hour commute when I have to, if I had to go during rush hour. So I thought about it. I contacted the people there. And they, they said they really, really wanted an ukulele class because it was doing fairly well. And so the long, the short of it is I, I agreed and I started doing it. Whenever we had it, it was like every Thursday from 7 to 8.30, something like that. And, uh, and I realized I didn't, you know, I had my own material. So I wasn't going to reproduce what Uncle Ben was doing. I'm just going to teach the ukulele boot camp and uh, he left his uh, he left his old dilapidated music stands which I which I bought from him and uh, and so it started that way and it started with um, basically the ukulele boot camp I figured again if if people can learn these practice sheets and uh, maybe learn crazy G and uh, what child is this you know uh, green sleeves then I mean, they, they wouldn't be beginners anymore, you know, they would and, and they would hopefully have confidence to go to any uh, song circle and join in, you know, that kind of idea. So that was my objective. And um, uh, I, I have to say, prior to that, I did have, you know, one off students here and there, um, but I wasn't I wasn't really looking for students. Some people just heard about me they contacted me see i have a couple of daughters that want to learn how to play the ukulele you know how much do you charge can you come over and so those were short-lived but uh i did some of that so it was kind of easing in and the position at the francis anderson center with the edmonds parks and recreation was the first regularly scheduled as it were ukulele lesson time so you walked in already having ukulele boot camp in mind or in hand? In hand, at least, yeah. So when did you develop that? Do you, can you remember? Yeah. Going going back now to that uh, ukulele cosmos. Yes. Uh, that was the first um, forum that I had, you know, participated in. And uh, I realized that, you know, just, just for myself, I would go through certain chord progressions just for fun. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if people would benefit if, if I if I wrote it out, if people would benefit from just noodling those, you know, just to make their fingers a little bit more flexible and uh, and possibly be e possibly even learning some chords with regard to learning chords. Let me just go back a little bit. Sure. Obviously, when I started in the sixth grade, you know, I just knew the C, A minor, F, G7 progression. And so every song, uh, every simple rock and roll song at that time, you know, had, had that progression. Eventually I learned that I needed to throw in a D7, you know, now and then, yeah. and maybe some other E minor. Like e minor or something, yeah. A weird chord or something. But for the most part, I was limited to just those four or five chords. And then I could transpose in any key by that point. So, but again, it was still five chords in whatever key 
I was playing. And I wasn't really playing anything too difficult. Um, so that being said, now let's see. I, I, that was my... I went off on a tangent. And what was your original question? Well, the oh, question the was boot, when you develop ukulele boot camp. Yeah. Right. The boot camp. So over the, over the years, as I began to learn songs that were not simply C, A minor, F, G7, D7, E minor, uh, I, I had to learn, um, especially in the bridge, where the, where the melody tends to differ, you know, what other chords go with this key? And, uh, you know, where... I guess I was looking at it linearly and spatially in my head, like where does it fit, you know, according to the sound? Because then I, once I learned D7, then I knew where a similar sounding chord would fit in any other key, right? Because the, the D7, for me, the D7 would form, uh, uh, would have a particular function in the song. Yep. And uh, so if I played it in an, another key, I would have it have to find their corresponding D7, you know, to fit in that slot. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry if that doesn't make sense. No, no, it but, makes total uh, sense. So, yeah, so that's how I um, uh, acquired chords, as it were. And, you know, everything is done by ear. So, um, you know, and my ear is not particularly, you know, sensitive or whatnot. And so eventually, as I started sharing song sheets with Supa and Strum, you know, I would have to make some corrections and say, you know, and somebody would say, wouldn't, you know, this chord sound better there? And I would play, yeah, it does. So then I would make corrections and then I would learn that one. And I don't know when it came, but eventually I started substituting D minor for F. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I like a mellow sound and yep. F is, you know, is straight and uh, harsh in a certain sense. But D minor was, was more mellow. It, it smoothed things out for me according to my ear. And so then I started uh, changing the arrangements and in place of F in, in several places, I started playing D minor and then eventually D minor seven. And then uh, I really liked the diminished chords in, in certain Hawaiian songs. And so I started adding, adding those in. And so getting back to Ukulele Cosmos, when I was noodling just to warm up or just to have fun, I would I would play uh, chord progressions, including all of those kinds of uh, you know chords, and uh, so as I was thinking of sharing, and I don't know if it's still up. I don't know if Ukulele Cosmos is still viable. It's still there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so I sent, I wrote a little message, a little thread, and I said, you know, these are some of the chords that I play when I'm just warming up, and uh, you might find them interesting so i i think i did that as a uh, text as a as a message and then i thought you know um i can do this for each of the five keys that i find um you know that are most popular so to speak you know, on songbooks so then i i was debating do i put the diminished and the minor sixth and you know all that kind of stuff in there and i thought well i want to make it melodic even though it's not a song the practice sheet hopefully has some kind of a uh you know continuity to it and um so yeah so i added the minor six and the diminished chords and all of this and created something for the key of c and then i just transposed it for f g a and d and came up with the five practice sheets and of course i started getting uh negative feedback like on the second line which had the diminished the diminished chord <laughs> and the minor seven and it's like do we have to play that diminished chord is so hard to and so i uh, came up with well it's unfamiliar it doesn't have to be difficult it's unfamiliar uh but and i kind of made them the promise if you learn the diminished chords then you'll be welcome in any song circle because when people say what is what is that g diminished you can show them what it is, you know. <laughs> now, for maybe for little kids, I might replace, uh, you know, leave out that second line or something. But and, and I'm I'm still in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, can I make a little boot camp more, you know, um, congenial for little kids or, or uh, learners? But that's still in the back of my mind. But, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So when I started teaching, since I had the boot camp 
already set up. I, I don't know how that boot camp idea came to my mind. I might have seen it actually somewhere before, but then I thought, okay, boot camp. So then each practice sheet is like an obstacle course. And I just kind of went with that little, uh, little uh, uh, orientation there. And I figured, well, nobody else is using boot camp, so I'll just call it Uncle Rod's Ukulele Boot Camp. And uh, so it it kind of happened that way. Then I I heard about Weebly.com, and so I quote unquote published uh, Ukulele Boot Camp And this other this one guy in Ukulele uh, Underground, uh, Fred, I think Sipe Fred Sipe, he helped me. Um, get it onto Weebly. And uh, I, I haven't been in contact with him since we put it up. That might have been 2008 or, or something like that. I forget. In fact, when you bring up the Ukulele Bootcamp title page, I think on the bottom it has a series of years. And so that kind of shows the uh, somewhat of the development. There's not a whole lot of development. I might have changed the text a little bit. And I really should add the keys of B flat and E flat to make it, you know, more complete, but not too many play in B flat or E flat. But anyway, now I, there's a couple things I wanted to follow up on before we go and take a look at the website, which we can do next. First of all, I just wanted to let people know that way back in 2003 and following when you guys are creating those books, I, I had to take a look here because I was thinking about it. Those daily ukulele books that are used by Jim Beloff mm -hmm. um, in all the clubs today, they didn't exist. They didn't come yes. out until 2010. Mm -hmm. So you guys were meeting. Um, I always say the rebirth of the ukulele consists with like three major things that happen. And this is just me. So this is that third wave. The mm. first was Jake Shimabakura's performance in Central Park that went vir virtual yeah. on, on YouTube. Mm. The second one is the work of Jim Beloff. And his Jumpin' Jim books. Yes. And the third one was, of course, Is and his Over the Rainbow, which was actually written 10 years or performed 10 years before it went crazy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so he was already gone when, yes. when that went crazy. So those three things almost all coincide with where Seattle jumps in and very early. And now, and if, if you're listening to this podcast in another place, Seattle tends to be a little bit more, and Portland, progressive in things. They just tend to be more progressive. They're earlier on in adopting things. Um, and they're also culturally very relevant because, for example, out in you know the, the Washington area, you have the home of Microsoft, you have the home of Starbucks, all these, these American corporations that are very forward thinking. So it's not really surprising. Um, so I wanted to mention that. And then the other question I had for you too, before we move on to look at your website is you mentioned that the person that you replaced, was it an Evans? What was the, the town? Evanston? Edmonds. 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 That's right. Edmonds, Edmonds, Washington. Um, you called him uncle Ben. Yes. Is that where the uncle Rod came from? Mm, no, not really. Uh, during the time at super, um, or actually, Prior to Supa, I, I found out that there was an active uh, Hawaiian community in the area. You know, I, I didn't realize there was anything. I, they, they had gatherings called Ho'olauleas, which is just a, a place to set up a vendor booth, set up food, and then have performance from the different hula studios. We call them hula halaos. And they would come with their little kids and adult dancers. And it was kind of like a fundraiser. Uh, and so in the process, I met a couple who had their own hula halal, you know, brother, cousin, sister, auntie, uncle, and all of that. And I was thinking, hmm, when, when do I become uh, an uncle? And, and it basically, it was like, if you're old enough to be an uncle, you know, you can, you can, get, you can call yourself uncle. So I started calling myself uncle back then. And a friend of mine who's uh, maybe 10 years younger uh, was just, you know, just his name. And eventually we started calling him Uncle Greg, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and in Hawaiian, we don't really call uh, the older people, grandma and grandpa, they're, they're auntie and uncle, you know. And uh, so it, anyway, it, it just became a way to fit into the Hawaiian uh, cultural community. And uh, I, you know, I like, I like 
being called Uncle Rod. So that's fine. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get us showing your website first. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna do that first, and hopefully it continues to uh, show us as we're going here. All right. So you can see that, and I'll make it a little bit larger here. So. All right, Rodney. So I have brought up your website and yeah. I can't really see myself talk right now, but you can walk us through mm -hmm. and um, why don't you just walk us through it's on the page and I'll try to point out, but I won't click on any links so I can bring those up separately. Right. So Fred's site is the one who, who uh, created this cover uh, screen. And so I really thank him for, for doing that because all I had was the actual PDFs. And but he created that picture, and uh, so the site. If you can scroll back down a little bit, the oh no, just just the three uh, different PDFs, right there. Yeah. Okay. So the basically the ukulele uh, boot camp is the um, item on the left. In the middle, I think it's called something like um, uh, what is it? A self examination tool. Yes, self examination tool for ukulele um pro proficiency or something like that right yeah and that you know the acronym there if you look at each in the, uh initial letter is set up <laughs> and basically all it is is the um not a summary but just a i just captured some of the stuff that's in the book boot camp and i created as a like a little test and uh my my um, idea is that if you can play what's in the setup in that test, then you shouldn't call yourself a beginner anymore. You know, you're, yep. you're past the beginner stage. Anyway, it was just for fun. And yep. then we'll take a look at that way... too. I'm sorry. We'll take a look at that too. Yeah. And it was also a way for, for me to show that it's easy to um, uh, modulate or transpose from one key to the, to the next, because if you follow each line, you know, it goes directly to the next key, that kind of idea. Uh, but let me let me go back and give you some credit for uh, uh, supporting the ukulele boot camp because uh, my first interaction with you was when you started uh, offering the videos that were so that are so helpful to my students. I mean, I tell them, go to YouTube, look up ukulele boot camp, and then you'll see this series of videos. That you can practice the practice sheet, each practice sheet, um, you know, and and it'll take you through uh, four strums all the way to one strum, and then you were gracious enough to redo them from eight strums to one strum, and um, so anyway, so thank you very much, Dr. Chris. I really appreciate that, and it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful, helpful self study guide on YouTube that people can use. Uh, you know, to help them go through each practice sheet. So going to the third one now to the right, it's uh, Aloha to You is like a, a mini, it's like a song book, but I'm also trying to show people how they can create their own song sheets um, by creating a sheet that only has the chord names, but uh, in the proper places, as it were, um, in relation to the song, and they can practice those at eight strums each, four strums, three strums, two strums, whatever, so they can get comfortable with the unfamiliar chords. And obviously, they're not duplicating the melody at that point. They're just uh, familiarizing themselves with the chords. But then when they finally come to the song sheet, the chords are in the same order. They're on the same lines, as it were, and now all they have to do is supply the melody and the rhythm. And then, you know, they don't have to worry about stumbling over, oh, how do you do that chord? They've already done that practice. And just scrolling around. So you've got the, we can just go over this information real quick. Mm -hmm. It's the the three parts about your boot camp. Yeah. And then um, you mentioned MP3s. Where are those located? Uh, let's I think if you will, if you go back up to the top, okay. Uh, what are the? I, We've got I a can't... popular favorite songbook, a Hawaiian songbook, and holiday songs and chord charts. And I, I think if you will click on the uh, that 
first one, the, the first one that has several words. The popular favorite yeah. songbook? I think if you if you click on that. All right, I'll try opening that, but I might have to change uh, screens that I'm sharing. Oh, okay. No, I guess I guess we're okay. Okay. Hmm, there's the public. Does it oh, there they are. Yeah, there they are. There they are. Okay. So then people can click those songs to listen to it. And is that you singing and playing? Yeah, I think so. I think so, pretty much. It's whatever <laughs> MP3 I could find at the time. And, you know, there. I mean, I need to add a lot more. And I've actually forgotten how to add <laughs> MP3s uh, to, uh, to that site. And I think there are the Hawaiian songs are under the Hawaiian songbook. I'll click that and um, see if I get kicked out here. Okay. Nope, I think we're okay. Okay, so are there Hawaiian songs there? Okay. Yep, there are. How about the uh, holiday songbook? In the holiday there... songbook. Um, oh, yeah, the holiday the holiday songbook is only the link. Right, only, only the, the link, link on the to the, the PDF. Right. So I don't have any MP3s, and I I really don't remember how to add them on there and. If you can help me with that, that'd be great, man. <laughs> I haven't used Weebly, but I'm certainly happy to take a look at it. Now, let me, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and okay. I'm going to take us right to, um, I'm going to take us right to the ukulele boot camp. Now, okay. while, while I'm doing that, what I wanted to share too is making those videos to help out was, was just a natural extension because I took your concept of the ukulele boot camp. And I turn that even shorter. So in my own method with my students, what I introduce is a chord. Mm -hmm. And then I have them play like an ukulele boot camp, one strum per four, one strum per two beats, one strum per beat, only using the chords that they know. So mm -hmm. as they introduce each chord, so I call those ukulele skill drills. Mm -hmm. And those have been incredibly powerful with Great. my students. So, so basically, if people ask, where did that idea come from? It, mm. it came from you. So and yours <laughs> is kind of like the summit of exam. If you can play all these <laughs> chords, you're good to go. But I take it chunk by chunk. So those mm -hmm. exist too. So like Great. if a kid is like, I teach G as my third chord. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a little bit of a debate because the move from F to G or F to G7 is more you know, same shape versus yeah. F to G, which is a complete turnaround. Yeah. But just like you tell people with that diminished chord that if they learn it, they'll get it. Mm -hmm. My statement to students early on is, okay, you play C and F already. I don't teach A minor because there's no songs that use C, yeah. F, and A minor, right? Yeah. You've got to have songs you can use. Um, so when I introduce the G chord, I tell them right off the bat, this is three fingers. This is a major finger shift. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But if you can master this, which you will, because G is the second most used chord. I study every chord that I put in these play <laughs> Um, And so does the, the ukulele hunt website. Mm -hmm. And G is the second most used chord. So if you master this G chord, which you're going to, later on when you have other chords you can't play, you can take a step back and say, guess what? I learned G. Yep. I can learn that. So yep. anyway, so, but anyway, that is how I use also the ukulele bootcamp and how I kind of modified it for, you know, every new chord that they add. So I'm going to share this. Oh, and there it is. I think people mm -hmm. can see um, the ukulele bootcamp and I'll just take them through. So if I'll, I'll scroll through as you want to talk us through. Yeah. If you go to the bottom of that first page, it does it start with like 2008 or something? Yep, 2008, 2010, 2011, yeah, and yeah. 2013. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think it was basically 2008 that I finally put this thing together um, in, in something like this kind of format and then quote-unquote published it uh, on Weebly or, or something. Uh, maybe not Weebly, but I would make photocopies and then hand them out to my students or anybody who wanted to learn. Uh, in fact, there was, there is, I think there still is, and a vendor at the swap meet at the Aloha Stadium uh, has uh, his whole tent. It's a big tent, and it's full of ukuleles, pretty much from uh, Asia, someplace. 
And at one time, I just gave him a bunch of those and said, these are free, you know, just give it out to people who are interested. And in fact, I even uh, tried to make half size copies, five and a half by eight uh, or five by eight and a half, five and a half by eight and a half, something like that. And um, but then it got expensive to to duplicate. So I stopped stopped doing that. And I just went to the full double sided full sheets. Um, and then then I just started handing out the link because they can always you know find the link uh, on the Internet and then they can print it out themselves. But I think it started basically all started around 2008. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that little disclaimer at the very bottom, all it says, you know, is it's free to use. Uh, just give me credit, you know, if you want. But you know, feel free to just duplicate it, pass it along. It's it's there for people to, to uh, help in self-study or even if they want to use it to teach a class, they're welcome to do that. That's awesome. It's incredible. And and this this really works too, by the way, just so people know, there's there's a reason why you use it and you've been using it since 2008 because the approach really works. Yeah, it made sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, these next few pages just introduce the concept. And I tell them they're only learning two things. They're learning chords. And ideally, they should learn the chords by, by the shape and the name. And then they're just practicing uh, changing chords, you know, changing from chord to chord. And once they know chords and can change from chord to chord within the rhythm of the song, then basically they're playing the ukulele. The thing that seems to stop people is when they want to start and they don't know what the chord is. So they learn the chord and they play, but then they have to stop because now they have to learn the next chord. Whereas if they have a, a treasury in the back of their mind of familiar chords or chords that show up regularly in, in many of the songs in each of those keys, then it's just a matter of learning the melody, learning the rhythm and the timing. And then they can just you know, learn whatever unfamiliar chord shows up that you don't, that, that's not there all the time. And then, uh, but if you can move from chord to chord smoothly without looking at your hand, without breaking the uh, tempo or the rhythm, then you're playing the ukulele. Now, I will also add that the other power here is that you're taking away the challenge of singing with it. Yes. So so there's there's power in that where you get practice just changing the chords and then it's logically changing on a beat, whether it's once every eight or mm -hmm. you're strumming eight times, five times, whatever, yeah. that you're, you're changing on a sequence. So you're not having to worry about following chords. And the other thing that this method really does is it also removes people's uh, getting all uptight about strumming. Mm. Yes. Because so many people get so worked up about the right strumming pattern. Exactly. And the, I mean, I imagine if you talk to any Hawaiian, there is no right <laughs> strumming pattern of any song, right? It's whatever yeah. the, the, the feeling of the moment holds is the strumming pattern that they're going to use. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, so that's the other, in addition to these two parts, learning the chord diagrams and practice sheets, you're also taking away the complexity of words temporarily mm -hmm. and the worrying about strumming patterns. So I, I, I mean, that's just brilliant. And it lets, it lets my students succeed. You know what I'm Great. saying? Great. So Great. I'm sure you used to have the same thing. So I'll let you keep going, Rod. I just had to no, throw that no, in there. Uh, no, and it didn't come to my mind. So thank you for giving me credit for that. But uh, actually, uh, as you go further down, uh, you didn't have to do it now, but, but if you go further down during some of the guidelines, I say strumming is the last thing you focus on, right? Because if you don't know the chords and you can't change from chord to chord, then working out the rhythm and the strumming is not going to help you. You, know, you have to be comfortable with the chords, with moving from chord to chord. Then you can start working on the syncopation and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yep. So uh, the second page had to do with uh, just showing them that they're going to be working with diagrams. Yep. And, and how to understand the diagram that there are, you know, two sets of numbers. Uh, one set of numbers tells you where to put your fingers based on index is one, middle is two, ring is three, and, and pinky is four. Um, and the other one is, uh, let's see, where to put the fingers. And the other is, uh, we uh, in Strum, we call it a chord helper. I, I don't know if there's a technical name for that four-digit 
description of the chord, but yep. but that just tells you where the dots are. And so, you know, one set of numbers tells you which fingers to use. The other, other set of numbers just says where the dots are. And, you know, technically you can use any fingers to form any chords. There are some conventions that, that seem to make more sense than others. But, you know, I know some uh, former guitar players like to use the thumb uh, over the top. And uh, I've, I've seen them play. They can do it. It sure looks odd, though. They're switching the, the position of their wrist, uh, you know, uh, it, to keep time with the music. But they can do it. And uh, if that's how they learned it and if that's what it makes them happy, then they're welcome to it. <laughs> well, what I always tell my students, too, is later on, sometimes you'll even use different fingers by plan. Yes. To, because you're going to a certain chord. Yes. But in general... What you want to do is you want to make sure that you are you learn the basics that are established mm -hmm. because they're established for a reason. Yeah. You know, the ukulele has been around since, let's just say, ballpark, you know, 1890. Yeah. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. and there's a reason why these are the chord shapes that we teach. Mm -hmm. So learn those first and then start doing other yeah. things. Missing you know what around. I mean? Yeah. So that's, 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 you know, learn the rules and then learn how to break them. Yeah. You know? There you go. So, so if you go to the next page, is that there's the a part about practice sheets? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. The practice sheets, uh, but we can look at each practice sheet and, and see it better. So are these the guidelines? Those are your guidelines. Yeah. So I think, I think it begins with make sure it's uh, in tune. In tune. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then one of the others is when you go through the practice sheet, um, start at like four strums each, but or, or eight strums now. And yep. I think one of the, the last ones is, you know, save your strumming pattern for the end because it's not going to help you to figure out a neat strumming pattern if you don't know the chords and can't comfortably and smoothly change from chord to chord. Oh, and also the fact that each practice sheet is not a song. <clears throat> right. There is not a particular melody at one one time i tried to create lyrics for the practice sheet but uh yeah and it was it was kind of okay but not really what i wanted so if i come up with something then maybe i'll make the practice sheet into a kind of song to help people remember it but um anyway but i, I think it's, it, it flows okay you have the rule too of always say the name of the chord as you're playing yeah. too right i um i suggest that because um, you know, every now and then you're going to be in a situation with others when they say, okay, we're going to play a D minor seven. And if you're not used to remembering the chord shape with that name, you might think you don't know the chord, but you do know it. Right. And in your mind, you probably call it something, you know, but if, if we use the uh, general convention, then we have a common vocabulary with which we can uh, converse uh, intelligently with one another. <laughs> <laughs> and if you play a diminished seven chord, you can choose any one of four different words for it or four different names for oh, it. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And see, I like the way you call it the diminished seven. I just learned it as a diminished with either a degree mark, a minus sign or D.I.M., you know. <laughs> OK, well, I've got the music theory. By the way, the other thing I was going to say before we get into your, your actual progression yeah. is um, what you have done without any formal music theory training yep. is you have decoded music theory the the theory of chords there's there's an order of chords in which they go and you've decoded that and part of the reason why the ukulele boot camp makes sense is that these chord progressions while they are just chords moving from chord to chord they also make sense in a harmonic sequence but you've discerned those just through listening and playing rather than the study of it. I mean, you've studied it, but not out of a book. And, and so that's another reason, Rod, why this works so well is because it actually is based in music theory, even though it's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're giving me too much credit, but I'll accept it. Well, I it's have true, no idea. It no doesn't make it untrue. Said, but yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, think about it. Think about how many musicians are out there that are professional musicians. And I'm not talking classical. I'm talking more uh -huh. pop musicians Yeah. who write beautiful songs, mm -hmm. beautiful songs that match and follow 
music theory mm -hmm. just because they they speak the language. So yeah, it would be like sense. yeah, it'd be like being able to write and speak a language without being able to read it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's you, but I'm just saying like pop yeah. musicians. Yeah. But they write music that is theoric, correct in theory, even mm -hmm. though they don't really know why. And that's yeah. okay because exactly. Exactly. that's how we learn context. That's why you have people that can communicate but are illiterate too. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in the English language, right? Because mm -hmm. they know how to speak, but they may not know how to read or write, but mm -hmm. they can still speak logically because they've they've learned the syntax they've they've been around it so anyway so yeah you that's another reason why this works okay so we'll just keep going with walk us through the practice sheet here okay well thank you very very much for that i mean <laughs> i would like to see you write a paper on how that works it'd be interesting but you know it'd be one of it'd be like one of those uh threads in the in the various forums where somebody explains what's happening and sometimes I read through it. Sometimes I, I'm thinking, yeah, well, great. Good for you. I'm glad somebody <laughs> understands it. But, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. So anyway, if you look at each practice sheet, there should be a total of 10 diagrams um, because there are a total of 10 different chords. And so what I was trying to do is I mentioned that on the practice sheets, there's a diagram for each new chord but then it's not repeated every time that chord is on the page. So like the first chord is C, but only the initial presentation of C has the diagram. And part of my reasoning is, you know, I wanted people eventually to see the, the uh, letter C and know what the diagram, uh, what, where they should put their finger, right? So every first line will have four diagrams because that's the first time you're seeing each of those chords. But like in the second one, the C and the G7, you've seen them before. You only need to know the names of the uh, C diminished and the D minor seven and, you know, on and on, so to speak. Um, yeah. So every page uh, are, there should be 10 diagrams. Some of them they will have seen before because like F is found in the key of C and of course F is found in the key of F. So, but I still write the diagram the, on its first occurrence. Yep. But this way, if they want to just focus on the quote unquote new chords, they can take a look at F and say, oh, I know F already. You know, I, and they just, they can just focus on the, the chords that are quote unquote unfamiliar to them. <clears throat> and the logical but, part of that too, by the way, is like, you know, the groups, at least here in the Twin Cities of Minnesota area where the, the ukulele clubs get together. Yeah. They, they're using the daily ukulele. And at the very, very top, you get a list of all the chords. Yes. So generally, when people start a song, they sort of peruse the chords to refresh their brain of what's yes. going on. Yes. Yeah. So that's happening here, too, is that you can peruse through these chords and make sure that you know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, the, the nice thing that um, Supa had done in their songbook is again, they had two vertical lines of chords on the right-hand side of each page, uh, one for soprano, well, one for GECA tuning, and one for DGBE tuning. And so the chord, the diagrams were there. And and I, I find diagrams easier to, to read myself because then I can see the placement of the fingers. I can see where the dots are. Uh, what Strum has decided to do is just outline a box with the four uh, uh, number sequence that identifies the chord. So C equals 0, 0, 0, 3. And, you know, if somebody uses that a lot, then eventually that can, can become more meaningful to them also. But sometimes when you look at the, just the numbers, it doesn't really tell you which finger to use at which, you know, point on the, on the fretboard. And so anyway... But again, we're, we're limited or we limit ourselves to the size of one sheet of paper. You know, I'm glad the daily ukulele can, can use those uh, lines or that space at the top to provide those. I think that would be very, very helpful. But, you know, some of the songs that we arrange have like 12 or more, yep. or more chords. <laughs> yeah. So, so, anyway, yeah, so there, every... there's the key of F. Yes. 
Um, there's the key of G. Mm -hmm. And then there's the key of A. Yes. Now, with your own students, which keys do they struggle with the most? Um, you know, I, as much as I ask for feedback, I never get that feedback. <laughs> I, I get I get complaints about the uh, diminished chords, you know, and some of the like F minor six, some of the four finger, or what could be four finger chords, or the F seven that uses four fingers, but um. I, I think maybe I just go through it, you know, fast enough that they don't have time to make comments. <laughs> and there's oh, the key of D. Yeah, and let me explain. There sometimes I have little uh, notes or notations on the page because, um, though, you know, I was able to find diagrams, but they didn't necessarily have the same name. Or I couldn't find the diagram. And so in the early uh, reproductions of the boot camp, I would have a dot like crossed off because I didn't have um, white out, you know, that kind of idea. And so I had to explain, um, for example, uh, A diminished, the, the diagram says C diminished because it's really the same, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I'm not sophisticated enough to, to just change it uh, to make it... Um, uh, clear. Uh, actually, there's a story about the diminished chords because generally, you know, there are three uh, finger formations for the diminished chords. And I used to call them one diminished, two diminished, and three diminished. You know, one with a degree and two with a degree and yep. three with a degree. And then when I, I started playing with strum, because Eric is a professional musician, and he became our bass player. He said, what's the root? What's the root? You know, one diminished doesn't mean anything to the bass player. Right. And of course, as you know, each diminished form has four names. Right. And so um, uh, Eric is the one who formats and prints out all of the music for strum. And so once he located the uh, root, he put it in, and so some of us are looking at what is an E flat diminished? Oh, 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 it's the same as you know. And so, if you look at some of my in my uh, personal collection of my quote unquote performance books, I have one diminished, two diminished. I mean, yeah, one, two, or three. And for ukulele players, that's all you need. You just need to know which position uh, diminished chord, which fingering to play. You don't re you really need to know the actual correct musical name of that uh, chord uh, but yeah bass players need to know the root and you know i just i'll try to explain this for people listening to the podcast too as quickly as i can or as easily as i can a diminished a fully diminished seven chord is a real special chord in music where each of the the notes in the chord is stacked um a minor third away from each other or three frets away from each other when you stack that chord up and on ukulele, we don't worry about really what we would call the inversion of the chord or what note sounds at the bottom of the chord. We just play a, a chord as we see it. We don't really think about that. Guitar players do think about that. Bass players do think about mm -hmm. that. But ukulele players don't. So ultimately, if you take that diminished chord and you take one of the middle notes and you put that at the bottom and you put the other ones above it, that would theoretically, in music theory, change the name of the chord. And because there's no note that acts as a stable foundation, that's one of the things about a diminished chord is that they're incredibly unstable and they want to yeah. collapse. Mm -hmm. um, that's also true of seventh chords as well, dominant seventh mm -hmm. chords. So like uh, a G7 desperately wants to collapse to a C, although it can also do what we call a deceptive cadence and collapse to an E minor. It can go to one of those either two, mm. but there are parts, the, the minor third and that, that stack of what we call a tritone, which is actually two minor thirds stacked on top of each other, they want to collapse like a black hole mm. and take you to somewhere else. So, so when you have a diminished chord and you think, oh my goodness, how do I know which one to use? The truth is, even if you call it the wrong thing, the only person that's going to get upset about that is a music theorist. Everybody <laughs> else will just go, okay, yeah, as okay. long as it sounds right. <laughs> so right. 
and, and both are true. The music theorist is right for it not being called the right thing because uh -huh. that's their passion and life's work. Yep. And the person just playing, it's okay if they see like on, if you're watching the video right now, we're on practice sheet number four, the key of A. And what Rodney was talking about is the A diminished there shows a 2323. Three, three, so your fingers are on uh, the second and third frets. By the way, Rodney, when you play that um, diminished chord, do you use four fingers or do you use a bar chord with two fingers? I use four fingers. I do too. I just, I was curious what you did as well. Mm -hmm. um, but when you see that on the description of that, that chord, it says C dim. It doesn't say A dim. So just, just so you know which one or what that really is. So just, just yeah. so people can, and why, by the way, is A diminished correct? Because the A chord collapses into the B minor seven, I believe, is the way that that actually works. <laughs> so we'll take it your word been, for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. But I, yeah, that's yes, yes, that's right. Because mm -hmm. A diminished would be the seventh step of the B scale. So yeah, so that's how that works. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, so those are the practice sheets, and then you have a last page here. Is there anything you want to cover on the last page? Uh, yeah, I can't read it. I don't have a copy in front of me right now, but I think. The main message is something like you'll notice that, you know, these are not songs. You're not really playing songs. You're just learning chords and uh, practicing moving from changing from chord to chord at a, a designated tempo. You know, you can make it as fast or slow as you want. And but the key is to try to do it without looking at your chord forming fingers and without breaking the tempo. And then uh, I think toward the bottom or something, I say, uh, oftentimes when you try to learn the ukulele, uh, well, well, let's let's put it this way: to learn to play the ukulele and and sing and to accompany yourself singing, there are a lot of um, factors that are involved. There's the lyrics, right? There's the tempo. There's the chords. Being able to change from chord to chord, and so I suggest that if people try to do all of that at one time, they're making it um, difficult for themselves. And it doesn't necessarily have to be so as long as they're willing to do some preparation in terms of learning the chords and practice, practicing changing from chord to chord within a certain tempo. And so when I start my classes, I, I let people know that, you know, how many of you can drive a stick shift? And, you know, how many did it perfectly the first time? Well, hardly anybody does, right? You, you need to kind of learn the coordination. Um, I, I hold up the ukulele and say, this is a tool. This is a tool that you use to make music. And just like you learn how to use an electric mixer, how to use a bandsaw, how to drive a car, you know, any any tool, useful tool, there's, there's a certain amount of, of preparation, learning that you need to do in order to learn how to use it properly but once you learn how to use it properly it can it can do what it was designed to do it can drill holes for you it can cut wood for you it can mix ingredients for you you know that kind of idea and so the same thing with the ukulele the ukulele will help you play certain sounds and you change the sounds by by depressing your strings at different places and if you if you learn how to do that and you know the names, then if somebody writes down a, a progression of chords, obviously just by name, you can play that progression. And if you know the melody, you can even adjust your rhythm and tempo to the melody of the melody of the song. So I try to say that the ukulele looks simple, you know, just four strings, a neck, and a body, but uh, it's not necessarily easy to play. It can be somewhat easy to learn to play, but in order to play it, you need to you need to do some practice, some preparation, and of course, mastery is a whole nother issue. Yes. But again, you can still get fluent with the ukulele, but you need to know the chords, and you you should practice changing from chord to chord, so that you can you can do it within the tempo, the strumming of the song, and I think that's what holds most people up they they go from one chord and then they stop and then they have to rearrange their fingers and by then you're on the you know two chords further down the line and so i i make fun with like happy birthday to 
you, happy <laughs> birthday to you, you know, and, and nobody wants to sing a song like that. But if you're not fluent with the, uh, the knowledge of the chords and being able to change from chord to chord within the rhythm of the song, then you end up, you know, having that uh, broken melody, so to speak. The other thing I'll add is that if people are going to use the videos that go with this, the one benefit of the videos that go with this is that you get a, a tempo track. You get a, yes. get a click as well. You get a harmonic background that plays along with it. But to anybody that uses the videos, I do encourage you also to get away from them too. Take the mm. sheet and practice away with that because you're building your internal clock is just as important as mm -hmm. following along. So you mm -hmm. do both, do both. Yes. So use the video, but also get on the sheet and find your own internal clock. And if you need to, buy a metronome. Yeah. If you need to, buy a metronome. But but that's excellent. Now I'm gonna pull up, Rod, um, one of the other pages here. The next one is the exam. <laughs> yeah. Just so we can just show people what that looks like real quick. Mm -hmm. I just gotta find the right tab here. Self exam for uke. Um, and I'll make that as kind of as large as I can on the page. There we go. And uh, so here's the cover. Yeah. And going through here is the the rules. Do you want to talk us through any of this? No, not, not really. If you if you just <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, scroll down to the actual test, um, it's it's just a simple uh, progression. C, A minor, F, G7, C, F, C, and then the final uh, chord, the A7, takes you to the next key. And so I jumbled up the keys. It's not C, F, G, A, and D. I jumbled up the order of the keys. Um, but in my mind, if somebody can look at that and can play through each of the lines at whatever tempo is comfortable for them without stopping ideally without looking at their chord forming fingers then you know they're way past a beginner ukulele player uh they're able to read the they're able to read the chords they can form the chords they can change from chord to chord at their set tempo and you know that those are a lot of chords there and i'll also add that um you've also taken away sort of the the non you know, the, the non-expected chords like yes. the minor six and the diminished chord out of this progression. Right. So really, if you are going to be teaching kids, ah. you might want to look from C to C on the first line, from F to F on the third line, and G to G on the fourth line. Yeah. That'd probably be a really good place to start. And actually, even A to A on the ah. fifth line, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would get you a really good start with kids, you know, thinking about a simplified ukulele boot camp for kids. Yeah. That's a pretty good formula right there. Great. Great. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And then I wanted to pull up your song book that you included just so we could share that. Yes. So I'm clicking into that right now. Um, oh, there it is. The Aloha. Yeah. All right. Aloha to you. Yes. There we go. And I'll make this as, again, as large as I can. Mm -hmm. Whoops, that's too large. Hmm. I want to be centered on the screen, just making sure I can see everything. All right. So here is the Aloha to you, the free songbook. Mm -hmm. And um, here's your rules on how to play new songs. Since I, by the way, Rodney's working on his phone, so that's why you can't read the screen if people yeah, are wondering. Yeah. <laughs> um, select a song to master. Create okay. a practice sheet with, with chords but no lyrics. Yes. Strum through the chord sequence. Then, after you can do that, hum or whistle the melody, and then actually go back to the original song sheet. Right. Uh, step six is experiment with strums and rhythms. And step seven is go to your next song. So... Um, I'll just pull up the first one here, which is Blowing in the Wind. Yes. Uh, if you so, go back up a little ways, okay. there, there is a, yeah, that is, what is it? The sample practice sheet for Blowing in the Wind. For blowing in the Wind, right. So the, the idea there um, is when you, if you want to learn, uh, I'm suggesting if you want to learn a song and you're unfamiliar with the chords, 
then you create a practice sheet that basically um, it's just like you you whited out all of the lyrics, but the chords remain in the same position that they would be if the lyrics were there. And the idea is to get you comfortable with, you know, which chords are on on uh, which line, because some uh, some lines may only have two chords or three chords, and other lines might have four or five chords. And if you're if you're comfortable with a blank sheet of paper with the chords set up like that and you practice four strums each, three strums each, two strums each, and you're comfortable doing that at a, at a tempo, then when you finally go to the practice sheet itself, the chords will be in the same uh, relative position to each other, but now they will be over the words or syllables where you need to change uh, in order to uh, have the corrected melody. When you, when you first practice, it's just strictly four strums per chord. You're not even thinking about the melody at that point. You're just learning the chords and practicing changing from four chord to chord with four strums uh, for each chord and then three and two, that kind of idea. And this is where a teacher's mindset helps because what happens as you become experienced as an ukulele player, you look at this song and you go, C, F, A minor, G, and G7. What's hard about that? But you forget what it's like starting off with the instrument. We we so, if we're not a teacher, we forget how we started and how challenging those things could be, how challenging mm -hmm. that G chord can be for the brand new player. Um, and I always kind of, I, you know, I, I go to ukulele groups and I'm a member of groups and there's always new people that are picking up an ukulele for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they sort of get this crash course while they're there of here are the first five chords. Nobody can remember them. Yeah, yeah. In the, you know, that space of that first day. You yeah. know, they just need repetition. That's where it goes. So what you're seeing with this method that, that Rodney is showing you with the song is another way to deconstruct the song so you can reconstruct it. Yeah. How do you learn a song? Well, this is one way to do it. You take away the lyrics. You focus on just the chords with strumming and just strumming at a beat in a pattern. Then you switch back. So, and, and then Rodney, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about this. No, no, that's great. Yeah. So, and you've got the song uh, Blown in the Wind. Yeah. Uh, Do, Re, Mi from The Sound of Music. Mm -hmm. Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue. Yeah. Um, boy, putting a G augmented, I haven't done that before at the end of that. Oh. <laughs> Well, you know, it, a lot of these, it, it just makes sense to me. It's it's filling in a little bit of, of gap. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to try that. I've never done that. Great. Um, the gym, show me the way to go home. I don't know if I know that song. Yeah, show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I don't yeah. know that one. Oh, really? I'll play Yeah, it I'll have to. Sloop John B, I know. That's yeah. the, from, from the Caribbean. I've yeah. been working on the railroad. Yeah. Um, singing in the rain. Mm-hmm. And then here's your transposing chart. Now, there's one song that's missing here, oh. Rod, and I, I need to ask you about, um, which has become your sort of theme song. Oh. <laughs> Where is that? And why Why? Why is that? Do you want to tell us what that theme song is and, and where it came from? Yeah, well, um, I, I like the song Rubber Ducky. And uh, so whenever we would get together, you know, nobody else would would suggest it. So I would select Rubber Ducky. And pretty, pretty soon people started. And, and what I would do is uh, it's number 100 in our songbook. And so I would do things like if, if, if people are celebrating the 100th, I mean, the, uh, if, if people are celebrating the centennial of something, what is that? And somebody would say, 100, okay, let's go to 100. You know, I just, I'd, I'd figure out an interesting way to get into them doing that. And I would say, uh, you know, besides latex, what can you use that stretchy uh, rubber? <laughs> hey, rubber ducky, let's. And so I would, you know, I would do that and people would, would listen to, and I'd try to get a more and more weird so that it's like, what does that have to do with rubber ducky? You know, it's it's almost like uh, the, the Sunday school, um, joke about a teacher says what's furry has a furry tail 
And during the fall, it goes around and collects nuts and, and hides it in a hole in the tree. And uh, the, the student, uh, the teacher selects Johnny and Johnny, and you know, this is Sunday school. So Johnny says, man, it sure sounds like a squirrel, but I'll say Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you, you got to look at your context, right? Uh, so. So anyway. Yeah, our pastor says that every sun, every oh, Sunday about well, he always asks a question, you know, very personable, and it's, he always goes, all right, so what's the answer? And then he goes, because remember, you're at church almost all the time. You can say Jesus. It's yeah, pretty Jesus. funny. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, anything. So, so anyway, um, so I started whenever I would, you know, start start with my little prologue there. People said, okay, let's turn to number 100 is going to be rubber ducky. <clears throat> and then I... Um, I came across some rubber duck stickers and some of these little, you know, rubber duck uh, squeaky toys. And I found out that I could order like a hundred of them from, from eBay for, you know, 20, 25 bucks, only uh, 20, 25 cents each. And uh, <clears throat> so I started doing that. And then I would um, uh, spay or neuter them by removing the squeaker. And then I'd impale them on the, uh, on the post of my uh, tuners and because they were so inexpensive, I would, you know, every now and then I'd, I'd bring a bag and I'd give it, give one to everybody who was there. And uh, right now, right now I have some CR 2032 uh, digital tuner batteries coming and they're inexpensive enough. So when we gather together, I'll, I'll cut them up individually and then hand them out to everybody and, you know, sometimes you just need a, a, a spare battery or a replacement battery because your tuner's not working. So I like to do stuff like that. But getting back to to Rubber Ducky, um, you know, it's just it's it's a fun song, and people started quote unquote giving me a hard time about it. But you know, we'd always end up with a smile on our face and and all of that. And then when uh, when we would meet outside, you know, people would be drawn to our music. And if there were toddlers or, uh, you know, young children, uh, I would go to the parents and ask them if I could give them anything, uh, give the child something. And they said, okay. And so I'd give them a rubber duck. And uh, this is when we're outside, when we're uh, in the past, before COVID, <clears throat> we were meeting at a local restaurant called Kona Kitchen. And uh, while, you know, we sang in the bar area, which was not busy at all, but some uh, families that were eating in the restaurant area would bring their children by to listen to the song. And we had what we call Frankenscreen. We call it that because it's made out of uh, white, you know, PVC piping. And Eric, you know, being the engineer that he is, created it because regular movie screens are horizontally oriented. And yeah. we needed something vertically oriented to show the, uh, to show the full sheet of song sheet. Yes. And uh, so we call it Frankenscreen. And and when we are able to meet uh, indoors, you know, everybody is literally on the same page. Yes. And of course, everybody's singing toward the screen and and the leaders are behind everybody, you know, singing over their heads, so to speak. But it works. It works for us. And uh, so, you know, that's how Rubber Ducky came about. There's a uh, nice uh, chord uh, progressions. And I add a little in the thing to it myself because i i hear something in there and i i want to play it but uh so that's how rubber ducky came up and as we had visiting instructors and musicians if i had an extra rubber duck i would give it to them and and some of them have it so it's almost like that shopping bag is it from maine that you see it all over the world now people on vacation and and they have this shopping bag from that one store in New England somewhere, so or or like the gnome, I yes. guess, right? They have that garden gnome that's uh, being seen all over the world. So one of these days, we'll see people playing ukuleles with. Hey, they got a rubber duck. <laughs> now, um, for our last question, because I mean, I really, yeah, he, Rodney's holding up his his yep. ukulele with a rubber duck, and um, so I also appreciate your time uh, both for today's podcast and the previous podcast, which is actually for us just all in one morning. But um, the other question I wanted to ask you before we left is um, to talk a little bit about your ukulele collection and your most recent acquisition. I know that you've talked about with me a little bit. Yes. 
So this is actually the most recent acquisition. It is a carbon fiber body with an ECOA. I think it's ECOA and carbon fiber, if I can read it properly from the sound hole. But um, it's made by Synergy Instruments out of Ontario, Canada. And I got it through a, a local dealer. Uh, if you order it directly from Synergy Instruments, they they have to make it from the time that you order it. So there's usually a four, six, maybe a two-month wait before you actually get it. And I did order one about a year ago that was uh, fully carbon fiber because that was the least expensive one uh, available at the time. And I, I, I ordered a concert because I like the concert scale, even though I like a soprano body. I would... I would prefer a long neck or concert scale soprano, uh, but you know this is this is okay. Um, but I found that when it came, the carbon fiber soundboard, um, it appeared to mute the sound. It was it was fine. Part of the reason I've gone to carbon fiber is um, prior to this I had the close uh, tenor, but again you know tenor is, is a little bit wide uh spacing for me yep. and it had it was a hybrid so it had a wooden neck and i wanted something with uh, completely carbon fiber prior to that i had the outdoor ukulele i still do the outdoor yep. ukulele is made uh, almost completely from polycarbonate and then i i had ordered some uh you know waterman and others and again part of the reason for that uh, actually let me go one more step prior <laughs> to that i had enya I still have Inya ukuleles made out of HPL, high pressure laminate, and we know it as Formica. And so part of the reason I started moving in that direction instead of, you know, very uh, uh, well-made and beautifully uh, figured solid wood is uh, because I'm a little clumsy and I tend to knock the ukulele around. And so I would get dings and scratches. And of course, I... I Fortunately, I haven't dropped one, but I can imagine, you know, what would happen to it if I dropped it. And so I started to looking at alternate materials that were relatively impervious to dings and scratches and drops and, and all of that, but still, you know, sounded playable, something I could use to lead a song circle. And uh, polycarbonate is okay, but, you know, they it's plastic, so it still has somewhat of a plastic sound. The... Uh, Close has a very nice sound. It has a um, sandwiched uh, soundboard that has carbon fiber and some foam in between, uh, very thin. Uh, and, and that sounded very, very nicely, but it was a tenor size. And uh, I, I eventually recently gave it to my, my nephew-in-law. Uh, when I was back in Hawaii, he was mentioning how he was looking to upgrade to a, a nice tenor ukulele. And I said, you know, uh, before you buy it, I'll send over something then. And if you like it, you can have it. And he liked it. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. But then when, uh, so I don't know how we got connected, but I I, uh, I got in contact or he got in contact with me, this guy who owns a, who has a uh, ukulele store, so to speak. And he dealt, and he's in Canada, Halliburton, Canada. And Ontario, and he uh, said, if you're interested in ECOA uh, carbon fiber concert from Synergy, uh, he said, I have one coming, and when it comes, we can do a face-to-face, -face. and if you like the sound, then I'll send it to you, and it can get to you in a week instead of two months. So that sounded, that sounded good, and eventually uh, it came in. We had the face-to-face. -face. It sounded good, and so I, I placed the order and it came um, uh, about $60 of it was transportation or shipping. Uh, so it was about 550 came out to 612, something like that. So it's one of my, you know, more expensive ukuleles. I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's one of my most more expensive ukuleles. And so I have ukuleles like Koaloha and, um, uh, oh, the one that uh, Mr. Raposa makes from Kauai. Uh, I forget the actual name of it now. And it's like a $1,300 ukulele, but I didn't pay that much. Pay that much. For yep. It. 
So I have some very nice uh, ukuleles. Uh, I was going to show one to you that had a, uh, you, uh, you've heard of that violin shaped body. It's yes. not actually a violin body, but it's, it's shaped like a violin with, you know, the different kind of curves and whatnot. I think it was originally made in Vietnam or something, but it was carried by a guy named, uh, or a, a company named Tanji, T-A-N-G-I. And I actually have a couple of them. I'm not sure where the other one came from, but are you familiar with, um, ooh, was he Ukulele Mike? This is before Mike. Um, uh, Mike the, Lynch. Yeah, before Mike Lynch. Yeah. Uh, he was with um, uh, HMS, Hawaii Music right. Supply. Right, yep. right when they, they became the ukulele site, unfortunately, he had some medical issues and he did pass away. Yeah. Um, but I was able to acquire another one of those um, violin-shaped ukuleles from his collection. And so I, I have one of that. And uh, I was going to show it to you, but as with many of my other ukuleles, I don't know where it is. <laughs> 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 I, you know, so... Basically, my uh, what I do is I tend to play one or two that I enjoy. And oftentimes when I acquire a new one, it becomes you know the one I, I play. Um, prior to this, I have an ukulele that's made by a local luthier. Actually, the first one I got from him, he acquired or somebody gave him a, a broken Martin Soprano. And he could not repair the body. So he just used the neck and then created a koa body. Uh, and uh, apologies to him. His designs tend to be stretched a little bit long. So they don't have the nice uh, curves that a, a Martin Soprano would have. But they sound great. It was, it's very loud. It has the Martin neck and his uh, own design uh, koa body. And I used to use it to lead uh, song circles because it had a lot of volume. Uh, a few years later, he actually created a long neck soprano for me as a as a birthday gift. And so I've been using that to lead song circles. And that's kind of my go-to ukulele if, if I have to travel and whatnot right now, mainly because I have a like a mini violin case that I found at Goodwill. And so I went home, I got that ukulele. I went back to Goodwill saying, this is my ukulele. And if you have that case, I want to take a look at it. And it fit. So it has a nice, uh, sturdy, plasticky, you know, violin case for that ukulele. Of course, now this one I can, I can bring in a paper bag and bang it around. It's not going to really hurt it, anything. Um, but this one is still... Uh, doesn't have as much volume as the uh, as the one that uh, uh, Carrie uh, built for me. And then um, a couple years ago, uh, I had mentioned that I wanted another long neck soprano, but five string. I wanted the uh, G string to be octave. And so he he gave he built that for me, and then I, I paid him for it. Um, but I don't enjoy it as much. Also, the, the low G is wire wound, mm -hmm. and so it really tends to carve out my fingernail. I have uh, my pinky, my index, and my thumbnail um, kind of long because of the way I strum. I don't really do uh, much picking, but I use those uh, fingernails to help with the volume, so to speak. But anyway, right now, it is a carbon fiber concert ukulele with an e koa so they use the same material that the blackbird uh, company uses e koa uh, which is like a uh, like resin a impregnated linen yeah linen yeah yep and uh, it it has more uh more volume so this past weekend when i was at the kalama heritage festival and we were leading the kanikapila or the song circle uh, this is the ukulele I was using, and it held up very nicely. Awesome. Well, Rodney, I want to thank you for for spending time with me today and um, not only telling us the story about your life, but showing us your resources and talking about those. 
I appreciate everything that you've done. I appreciate you allowing me to make videos out of your material and uh, for giving me the inspiration to make some things that are actually more, uh, I mean, they're really instructionally sound for my own students based upon your, your work. And I appreciate your positive presence in the ukulele community. I've never seen you say a harsh word to a single person. Um, I mean, you're just overflowing with kindness and goodness, and I, I just appreciate you a lot. So thank you for, for sharing with us. Well, thank you for this opportunity. You know, life is too short to be mean. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, and then ukulele truly is a fun instrument. And, uh, you know, if you're not having fun, stop, take a break, do something else, come back to it. You know, and uh, like for me, it's just been a hobby for 60 plus years. And I'm just so thankful that my sixth grade teacher taught us and uh, that the good Lord gave me, I guess, an ear so that I could hear and, you know, begin to uh, arrange music and all of that. And, and we have a lot of ukulele groups in the Seattle area, which is kind of nice. And I've been attending a couple of them. Uh, and I, I just wish we had made contact when you were up here in Seattle. That would have been great. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can make that happen again at some point. Um, also, I should ask, where can people find your work? Um, we've got ukulelebootcamp.weebly.com, but where else are you at, like in terms of YouTube, where people can see your work? Okay, actually, I I, I did upload some things to YouTube, but more recently, I've been up uh, posting things on uh, Facebook. <clears throat> within the category called Landia, I think Bernadette might have kind of started that group. And uh, when I was in Hawaii from the middle of December, 2020 to the middle of June, 2021, um, I started uh, uh, finding little collections of PDFs. Actually, this is what I, I, want, I want to do still. And I'm, I'm finding difficulty now in Seattle because I think the link is to a PDF that's too large, so it's difficult to post. But what I wanted to do, uh, or, or this is, uh, you know, you find a problem and you try to solve it. This is one of the problems, you know, maybe problem is, is too harsh a word, but this is one of the current concerns uh, I, I, I think I find in the ukulele community. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, song sheets and, and uh, uh, club songbooks and whatnot that are going around. And, you know, for any given song, there are a lot of covers, so to speak. So when I arrange a song, I'm trying to put down on paper what I think I remember somebody singing. So, for example, if I, if I create a song sheet for Sway, I'm hearing Dean Martin in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, other people have done Sway and... You know, there's a, just a little bit of difference, but because I'm listening to what I think Dean Martin sounds like, I put down the chords uh, and the phrasing that's familiar with me. Another example might be Beyond the Sea. Uh, is it Beyond the Sea, the Bobby Darren one? Um, so I, I hear Bobby Darren singing that song. And so when I create the song sheet, that's what I put down. And so I think. I don't know if this is actually true, but I'm thinking that some people, when they come across, for example, the strum song book or the super song book, uh, you know, and they try to play it through, uh, they try to play a song that they know, but maybe from a different artist, then they're, they're in, uh, encountering chords that may not fit what they remember hearing. Yep. And so I wanted to provide a video um, uh, music uh, with, I mean, uh, uh, a video presentation or performance with a PDF so they can see that, you know, when we put together this song on this piece of paper, this is how we wanted it to sound, or this is the sound that we were going for, you know, right. that kind of idea. And eventually during this COVID time, it almost became a virtual song circle where I would select uh, four or five songs from a song book. I'd send out the PDF so people can either look at it on a tablet or print it out ahead of time. And then they can play it and I can play it and we can just go through it, you know, like, like on Zoom or something like that. But we'll do it through Euclandia on Facebook. 
And so my my latest project, which I have not hardly even begun, <clears throat> and I think the problem is the PDF is too large, um, is to go through the Strum Volume 1 songbook, the lock, the um, cruise songbook. But now I'm having difficulty um, breaking up that one large PDF into a small enough collection that will allow me to post comfortably, you know, on Euclandia or on Facebook. So once I get through that, then I will try to do it. So now getting back to your original or your initial question, uh, there are some things that I have on YouTube and I believe you can, you can, uh, people can search for Uncle Rod and I'm going to say Amapola, A-M-A-P-O-L-A. -A -A. That's one of the songs. But I think if they can find that, then they'll see others listed and, and they can go, you know, uh, and find some of the other songs. But most of the songs now are <clears throat> in Facebook and you can either look up Rodney Higuchi, because that's how Facebook knows me, or you can look up, uh, you can search for Landia, and then just kind of scroll through and eventually you might find some songs. But I have a lot of songs on Facebook via Euclandia. Um, I think I might have gone through the entire, uh, or most of the holiday songs. And since the season is coming up, I, oh, and also if they go to the ukulele boot camp, there should be a link to the holiday songbook and they can see how we usually do those songs in case they come across a chord progression and says, that doesn't seem to fit. How do they do that? You know, then they can have, uh, auto, uh, 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 they can hear it as well as see the sheet music or, or not the sheet music, but the song sheet. Yeah. And that's one of the things that people need to understand is that if you don't read music, like if you don't read notation, and I don't know if you do or not, you know, Rod, in your own life, but if you don't read sheet music and you're looking at a chord chart or, a, you know, just a song sheet, if you don't know the tune, you're in trouble. Yeah. But again, the ability to read music, even though I'm a music teacher and it's one of the things I work really hard to teach my students because it just opens a door to them later, whether they're mm -hmm. going to be a professional musician or not. Mm -hmm. um, you also realize there are, again, plenty of musicians that don't. So, yeah, so you're right. It's when you have an arrangement of a song and then all of a sudden you're playing the song and the chords don't seem to fix fit the yeah. version that you know, that can be that can be frustrating. So, yeah, so people that are interested can find you on Facebook and Euclandia. Yeah, Euclandia is a uh, creation of Bernadette mm -hmm. that she originally had started just as a community for for her, you know, her own work. Yes. But it expanded and she kind of lets it go as her own own thing. I mean, she's still involved with it, but there's mm -hmm. a, a heavy, um, it's heavily moderated to be clean and family yes. friendly, yes. which is, and super positive. So you're, right. you're almost never going to get negative people and, and negative comments and things are often uh, deleted because they don't fit the, the spirit yeah. of the community. So yeah, yeah. that's why, yeah, that's why I don't have links on Euclandia because I think they said you can post something, but don't just post links to other sites. Right. And so, yeah, so I don't have links to uh, a YouTube site, but I have a link to a PDF that should correspond with the music that I'm playing on the video. Hope uh, right. I don't think it's been taken down, so hopefully that's okay with them. I think it's okay. I think if the, the video itself is uploaded to Euclandia, that's the one that they're more concerned yeah. about. Mm. So, but again, that could change too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so Roddy, it is it's just a pleasure to visit with you. And again, hopefully in the future, we'll get a chance to, to get a cup of coffee together and, and um, maybe sit down by the, you know, by yeah. the, the sound there and just have a cup of coffee somewhere uh, we can we or, or we can meet and in hawaii and i can accompany you when you get your kamaka well that could be yeah because yeah rodney knows that my dream is a hf2 um maybe an hf2 deluxe i don't Whoa. know yeah i don't know mm -hmm. you know and that's the one at the cedar top and everything which Ooh. yeah i would love that yeah, but hey, we'll go. see. all right yeah. All right, and to everybody that's listening, thank you for listening and watching the video. I hope you found this informative. I know that I have, and I learn things every time I talk to people, and I love hearing their backstories. So, 
Rodney, thanks so much. I appreciate you coming on. You bet. Thank you, Chris.